Hello, everyone. I'm Gary Kim with IP Carrier. Uh, we're here today with Jefferson Wong, who is a managing director at Accenture. He's got a team of about 400 uh, professionals working on networks and uh, connected solutions. What that means in sort of English is he works with enterprise verticals uh, in, in terms of the way they use networks for digital transformation. Uh, his uh, portfolio includes 5G, uh, Wi-Fi 6, private networks, artificial intelligence, edge computing, and many other things. Uh, I will say Jefferson is one of the few human beings who will be speaking this year who has a background spanning consumer electronics all the way to networking and enterprise verticals in between. So he's got a very, very broad uh, background. And with that, Jefferson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gary, and thank you, PTC, for having me. Really excited to be there. Uh, we wish we were in person, but uh, we all know how that goes. So today we want to talk about 5G plus AI plus IoT and what's really beyond this magic. How do they work together? What are some opportunities for the, the folks in the ecosystem? But I think before we go into what the opportunity is, around just 5G AI and IoT, it's really important to figure out what are the different parts of the value chain that we could be thinking about. So when you look at an operator's perspective, there's certainly an enhancement to your connectivity layer. So now adding 5G to it, adding a layer of edge compute to it, figuring out how you can capitalize on a reliable and secure network uh, over other opportunities like Wi-Fi. That's kind of what we call like the enhanced opportunity. Then building off that foundation, moving to really the analytics capabilities, can we add more real-time data processing? Can we add more AI into this so that now we can actually provide a service of value to the actual enterprises? And that moves us to really the third opportunity around how could you potentially digitally transform? And this is really about taking those horizontal technologies, those capabilities we just talked about, and then really just vertically applying them to these industries like industrial manufacturing, healthcare, and all of these other areas that we've heard a lot about. And how do we make that personalized? How do we make that industry specific? And how do we actually find value in that? So it's really important to kind of highlight those three steps of certainly this journey can actually continue all the way to the end, or there could be parts of the players who just wanna stop at maybe the analytics capability and be more of a platform player so that you're just offering an enhanced level of connectivity around 5G security and edge and reliability, adding the analytics capabilities and just letting the actual ecosystem build on top. There's others who may wanna be a little bit more uh, aggressive and actually find vertical solutions. So setting that context leads us into how do these three pieces really work together and what's the opportunity? So if we kind of look at those three things, when, when, when Gary and the PTC team uh, kind of approached me with these, uh, it, it was nice to hear them think about these in concert. It's almost like the perfect match when you really think about it, that now we talk about 5G and all these different ways to deploy. There's private networks, there is public uh, that's going to be deployed as we speak today. And then ultimately, what does a hybrid look like between public and private 5G deployments? And then how does that actually offer broadband at a, at a higher speed in, in a mobility mindset? How do we think about a more responsive network? How do we think about connecting more devices, 10x more devices than we did in 4G? What benefits does that provide? But then you look in the middle and really the key here is it, it doesn't get as much as attention, but the AI component, how does AI actually help the, the actual 5G side with deployments and actually operations of a more complex, dense network? But also how does AI help the right-hand side with IoT, with number of devices, orchestrated uh, data, figuring out how to unlock value that's hidden. And AI becomes the actual kind of middle component that unlocks both. And then you really go to the right-hand side and you kind of see all of these new devices that are connected, but you really see there's also quite a bit of connectivity fragmentation. So we've seen IoT work before on Wi-Fi. We've seen it on unlicensed spectrum. We've seen it on some license spectrum as well. And is there an opportunity for this next generation, this next dawn of connectivity to really harmonize all of that, to make it easier to get to? Uh, so a lot of times you see Wi-Fi take off early because one, it's very inexpensive. 
Two, it's very available. So you don't need uh, to activate a SIM. You don't need to provision a device. You don't need to do any of those things. You simply need to have a Wi-Fi connection. You can start to develop and build on top of. But does 5G provide an opportunity with AI to allow the developers community, the ecosystems to get easier access to this? Can it harmonize IoT so it's a little bit easier to work with, a little bit easier to get access to? And how do we actually find that price point come down so that we can start to get to the very top part of it, which is digital transformation. And that's kind of, we, we call that the multiplier effect on, on both sides. And that's why it was really nice to hear that you know, these three would be in concert on, on, on this conversation. They, they really do work together when you think about it. 5G offering a new type of connectivity, AI being able to orchestrate not only the dense networks that are required for high band millimeter wave, um, on the 5G side, but also the number of devices, the sheer number of devices and the sheer number of data coming off of it. How do we extract value out of it? Because all of this is gonna require an incredible amount of investment. So there has to be a way to find the right use cases. There has to be a way to find the right way to monetize this. And there has to be a way to actually bring the partners together so that everybody works uh, towards a common goal. So then if we look a little bit about the challenges of 5G. And, you know, I've spent about the last five years kind of focused uh, in 5G across the world, but certainly before that, you know, 21 years in, in wireless has taught me a couple of things that a, a lot of times the promise of each next generation uh, is a little bit further than the reality. So understanding where each of these challenges are is really important. And again, based on the audience and depends on where you're on the globe, but, but these challenges, some may ebb and flow differently. When you look at number one, spectrum availability and deployment, a lot of the challenge now we see is that access to aggregated 5G spectrum isn't always uh, as easy as we think. There's certain countries that want to focus on high band uh, and, and allowing more high band spectrum in the millimeter wave uh, area so that you have a ton of it available. You can go really fast it just goes short distances. Globally, we seem to be finding sub six as obviously where we're centered and, and focused on. You'll see a lot of the modems, the devices, and the ecosystem really focus a little bit more on sub six. Um, and, and that becomes almost like a standard, almost like a good balance between that sheer speed due to available spectrum, but also distance you can cover. Uh, and then you'll find certain parts of uh, the geographies uh, rebanding um, finding new ways to do DSS or dynamic spectrum sharing around the low band so that we can get more of a coverage, right? So if you kind of think about that, that high band is really that focused speed, the low band is really the coverage component to it. So not all countries have decided how they're going to unlock this spectrum in those bands. Number two is really the use cases in the business models. And a lot of times what you'll see now is as 5G starts to continue to deploy, there's not necessarily an upcharge to 5G for the consumer side. There's not necessarily a premium yet to be charged. That leads an opportunity to say, what is the new business model? Where is the new position for an operator? Where is the actual opportunity for the use cases to fix and think through? And again, if you, if you look at kind of what we talked about on the consumer side, sheer speed may not be a way to monetize the mobility side of 5G, but it certainly harmonizes on a currency. So if you think about your home, a lot of times we're used to paying for more speed. When you actually look at a mobile environment in 4G days, we were used to paying for a megabyte. Now speed could be a unified potential currency where between your fixed line and your mobile line, we're unifying on speed. But there's other currencies available like we talked about in that first slide is reliability, is security, is responsiveness, opportunities to actually drive value from the network like we did with the megabyte before? And then are there new services on the consumer side that we can start to think about? Um, next gen communications, more immersive entertainment. How do we actually expand beyond kind of either our living rooms or the environment that we're in that become first party services on the consumer side that there may be uh, a monetization opportunity for. Then the big side of number two that everybody gets most excited for and why 5G is really built is the enterprise side. And you look at what is the areas to cover when you look at vertical industries around 
Manufacturing are, are desperate for digitization. <clears throat> a lot of healthcare is looking for new technology as an opportunity uh, to improve. Um, and, and all of these have very, very defined value chains. Even if you look at healthcare, a hospital is different than a private practice, which is different than actually adhering to the actual treatment or actually being at home. Three totally different value chains. Uh, manufacturing, you know, a wood manufacturing plant is completely different from a metal manufacturing plant. And both of them may be under one conglomerate to produce a single product. So all of these are very, very distinct industries that require a lot of in industry knowledge and feeling out of the pain points so that you can best address technology concerns. And a lot of times what we see is that you find 5G almost looking for an industry to solve versus really figuring out where are the actual real problems and which ones best apply from a 5G perspective, an edge perspective, AI and IoT. And that's how we typically think about it is really understand the industry, understand the pain points, figure out the value and then decompose it into which use cases can 5G best solve, which ones can best solve 5G plus AI and IoT because those are different answers. Then in the third one, this really goes to the IoT piece, these device innovations and these technology breakthroughs that we're finding. You'll see that obviously more and more devices are actually, we call it in a decade of divergence really. And if you just trace it back to the 3G world, 3G days, we had a flip phone to talk and text. We had a laptop to do our productivity work. And we had an iPod to listen to music. In the 4G world, we converged down to a rectangular slab that we hold in our hands today. In the 5G world, it's another decade of divergence where we'll take discrete functions out of the smartphone and you'll start to see it's already happening, right? You'll take connectivity, you'll take compute and you'll take storage into something like a watch. And now all of a sudden you've broken that out and become a standalone product. We'll find that more and more as compute power gets closer to the data generation source, that's where value lies. Whether that's closer to the human body on the consumer side, closer to the machine that's creating the actual uh, data, the vibration, the actual um, noise or any of those things, that's where the actual value is, is we get these devices closer to the data generation source and adding the ability to process out noise versus what's valuable, the ability to act on it in near real time, that's where the real excitement comes in when you think about IoT proliferating, harmonized on a 5G network, using AI to be able to actually get through all of that uh, noise and actually finding the value. On the left, number four, if you think through the network technology and deployments, there's still a lot of maturing for 5G to do. So again, when it comes to network slicing, we're still not quite there yet from a, a standalone network, standalone uh, perspective. Um, network density is still an issue, right? Is millimeter wave going to just be for uh, potentially private networks in targeted areas with fixed perimeter or even just uh, certain laser focused areas of the environments? Uh, will sub six be kind of the general layer or the macro layer that covers more of the mobility use cases? Um, how do you get past all of the zoning rights, all the deployment challenges, um, all of those things? So again, th there's quite a bit of work to do in, in number four with the network deployments. Number five, when you look at the challenges with architecture and platform innovation, um, the partnerships with the cloud providers is incredibly important. Will it be kind of sole sourced at first with a really push into digital transformation through that? Will there be more multi-cloud integration that's required? What is a clear edge strategy? Is it more than just a real estate play? How do you think through those? And then number six, uh, a lot of operational complexities that we talked about, that 4G and 5G is gonna coexist for quite some time. All this small cell density requires and almost needs that AI to be able to determine all the operational issues, all the different um, network operation centers issues that you're going to see when you when you densify a network to that extent, uh, you're going to see that sea of red just multiply in your network operation centers. And how do you deal with that? When we bring in these new deployment models where you're deploying a public network, but you've also got these private networks that are out there, how are you providing that same level of service? How are you actually still providing that SLA? Um, and again, that leads to how do you move to a more business centric um, 
process. And, and that's also sales motions. That's also support capabilities. That's also how do you actually speak the language uh, of these industries? And that's the real challenge uh, with, with the operational side of things, that it's not just the technology side. It's not something just 5G, AI, and IoT can solve. A lot of these are actually created. Uh, so how can we actually best address those? So then we walk a little bit into, you know, what are the use cases available? And <clears throat> this is absolutely not exhaustive, but it's an interesting framework to think through that, that we walk clients through. The first is really what segment are you actually addressing? Is it the consumer that we talked about? Is it SMBs that make up a majority of the enterprise space? Um, or is it the, the actual enterprise verticals? Um, or is it the government? Or is it the actual enterprise side of things, the, the industrial side of things like oil and gas and utilities? Those each require potentially different network deployments. They may require different devices and sensors and IoT. They may require a whole different level of analytics uh, dependent upon which customer segment we're talking about. And then actually just simply taking the advantages of 5G and layering them across certain use cases. Again, again, not exhaustive, but you know, we have an entire use case catalog that goes through this. But when you look at starting from left to right, what's easier to deploy versus what's harder to actually implement when you think through it, certainly enhancing connectivity, finding a new way to connect like a fixed wireless solution um, in the enhanced mobile broadband becomes a little bit easier before you get to higher resolution because that requires a change in that value chain. Uh, higher resolution video may require different cameras, may require different processing, different encoding. That's a different value chain that you have to fix versus uh, a fixed wireless solution is simply just the backhaul, simply just the connection. We can just change that, make that fa faster, more reliable, more personalized. Uh, but when you actually get into value chain changes like higher resolution video, immersive entertainment, those require those value chains that need to actually adopt, which means more ecosystems. Uh, before you get to even kind of next-gen communications, next-gen social, um, and those pieces. So that's kind of on the, the way to think about the use cases available, how they actually go from crawl, walk, run, and then how you have to think about partnerships from can you do this yourself to I need a good solid partner to I need an entire ecosystem to deliver this. And each of those requires a question around what part of the value chain do you want to play in in those different versions. Then we talk about more responsive, more ultra low latency scenarios and use cases. What are the ones that really take advantage of 5G plus edge plus AI and IoT? Um, extended reality becomes a really interesting use case. <clears throat> we'll start to see, we've had a lot of actually false starts uh, with VR dating back to the 90s, but again, separating out extended reality into certain categories to figure out when's the best time to use virtual reality versus when's the best time to use augmented reality and actually what's the best way to deliver that. So for example, a, a lot of work that we've been working with on clients is if it's a training environment, it may be better to do that in a virtual scenario. So instead of doing a computer-based training, you actually put them in a virtual environment and you actually immerse yourself deeper into the learning and you actually pick this up quicker but then when you get out into the field and it becomes more of a on the job training, remember what the training was, that may be the right time to move to more of an augmented reality an overlaid scenario to actually assist you, but not put you in a virtual environment. So the, the, the depth of each client understanding when's the right time to use which technology and how does it take advantage of 5G, AI, IoT differently uh, is incredibly important. Um, the reason extended reality is interesting is again, uh, motion sickness for virtual reality, the alignment on augmented reality requires a very responsive network. Uh, but again, the key is how do you actually apply that to business value? When we go to more autonomous vehicles, I think there's a lot of discussion plus robotics and automation. Um, these require a little bit more of a challenge because for example, full autonomous state and local versus federal is very different. Uh, when, you, when you work through policy, that again, we, we put it a little bit later on um, because you have to think through the safety, uh, federal versus state and those things. When you get to pure massive IoT, you know, sensor is, is certainly where a lot of the priority is right now, working through uh, the actual types of sensors. And what's interesting is what we see is a lot of sensors aren't all created equal. There's a lot of times you go into an environment where you need a, 
a category one div, div two type of sensor where even a small spark in the environment could cause an explosion. So how do you actually work with the actual device manufacturers, the ecosystem providers to say, hey, I need this type of shielding. I need this type of a sensor. Uh, so again, that's gonna follow as the, the network gets deployed and the actual value cases get built. How do we actually follow that with the ecosystem, which could be the, the sensors, the modems and those pieces to it. But once we can get massive sensors out into play, how do we actually think more about these spaces becoming smart spaces, smart districts, smart cities? And again, we use the word spaces because it could start to is just a smart building. It could go to a smart campus. It could expand to a smart district and ultimately can it in, expand into at the end a, a smart city. So those sensors need to actually work with kind of the actual space. The space needs to actually find the use cases to actually generate value off of. Um, and then we can talk a little bit more about kind of non, non line of sight drones as a massive IoT use case. Um, line of sight right now is already being done. Obviously there's no issue with um, uh, internet of the sky when it comes to this, but is there an opportunity for a non line of sight? Does that take more policy to get past? There's other parts of the world that I've been to that just have a no drone policy in certain cities. Uh, so again, as policy creeps its way in, uh, those become uh, a little bit more complex to work through. And then finally, just to, at the bottom, the deployment scenarios are, are really important to think through that if this is in a building, right now it's difficult to get millimeter wave inside of a building. What do those propagation um, characteristics look like? versus a, a venue, versus a wide open space where you've got line of sight. So that's kind of the third layer of, of thinking through this. Um, so let, let's just take an example really quick. If, if we just dive down into one of these specific use cases and talk about 5G plus AI plus IoT, <clears throat> this is a industrial manufacturing example. If you kind of see on the left, there's, there's certainly the on-prem plant network um, with a logic control board connected to ethernet and, and some of those uh, pieces that exist today. And then you look through and you see, you know, a lot of that actually already has network ready machines and it doesn't make sense to rip and replace that just yet. There is also the plant floor gateway, which, which could be on Wi-Fi, which could be on other technology, unlicensed spectrum that has a lower cost vibration sensors, uh, cameras attached to it, uh, you'll hear a lot about CBRS uh, in the U.S., but uh, for our folks that aren't in the U.S., as, as spectrum sharing becomes more open and, and bands become open, what is the opportunity for uh, operators to work with or also have other players enter the value chain? Um, but there's the right-hand side, which is really just pure wireless. Is there an opportunity to have connected workers, wireless sensors work on just a wireless edge gateway? And you may ask, what's the, what's the reason behind that? And there's a lot of different complexities to this, but if you think about connected worker being really sensitive information that you don't want to go to the public internet, that you don't want on a non-secure network that really should go through maybe a private network, 5G, AI, IoT scenarios where you can really keep that worker's information on-prem, you could break the traffic out from not going to the public cloud or public internet. You could actually process things in real time. Like if a worker is actually not wearing the correct protective gear where they don't have their hard hat on, their goggles and their vest on, the actual machinery and equipment won't start. And then finally, if they're getting too close to actually other workers because uh, of, of social distancing or because they're getting very close to machinery without seeing some piece of clothing that's hanging off could get sucked up into the machine, how do we in real time or near real time stop those things or warn them? Uh, so just an example of how 5G plus AI plus IoT can work together. Um, so excited for everybody to have a wonderful PTC show and uh, hope to see you guys all next year. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you, Jefferson. And thanks for joining us at PTC 21.